I'd like to welcome you to today's talk here in the gallery. There are a few more uh, folding stools available in the back of the room if you need one. Um, I'd like to ask that you please avoid uh, getting too close to or leaning against any of the exhibit cases for your safety as well as the objects in the cases. Thank you. Uh, I'm Janet Baker. I'm curator of Asian art here at Phoenix Art Museum and have been for 19 and a half years. And it's my honor and pleasure to um, share with you today uh, things that are on view here in the gallery, which uh, the entire Asian gallery was reinstalled this past August following uh, the uh, venue of Wondrous Worlds, Art and Islam through Time and Place that we had on view. I hope some of you had a chance to catch that wonderful exhibit. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to walk through what's on display here now, feel free to do that uh, later today and encourage friends to come back. Uh, a good deal of what's up now will remain on view uh, until early next year. Uh, some of the textiles will be changed, uh, some paintings will be changed, uh, but you, this, open, this uh, inaugural reinstallation will be largely on view for uh, uh, well into uh, March of 2020. So enjoy between now and then. Feel free to bring uh, friends and family in over the forthcoming holidays, and of course, we have Legends of Speed, which is going to be wildly popular, uh, particularly with um, the men and the boys, I think, yes. But today we're going to focus on jade and talk a little bit about what is jade and what its role was in Chinese society for a very, very long time. Um, I'm not uh, particularly uh, knowledgeable about gems and mineralogy or chemistry, but jade is an ornamental mineral that is primarily known for varieties of green, but can appear in other colors. As you look in the cases here, you will see there are sort of subtle variations of green to gray to beige and shades in between. Um, it can actually, re the term jade can refer to two different minerals. Nephrite, which is a silicate of calcium and magnesium, sounds like a supplement you might take, um, or jadeite, a silicate of sodium and aluminum. So chemically, those are two very different stones, but they are both considered jade by geminological standards. All of the pieces that we are looking at today are nephrite jade, which has the longest history in China going back to the Neolithic period, which we will talk about exactly what is Neolithic. Jadeite, however, was something discovered when in the 18th century, the Chinese Emperor Qianlong expanded China's borders, shall we say, to parts of Burma that had resources of jadeite jade. And I'll show you some pictures of that later. It looks quite different in appearance because chemically they are two different things. So nephrite jade has been mined and worked in China since Neolithic times and has been used to create a number of utilitarian as well as ceremonial objects, some of which we have on view here. Somebody's phone is alerting them to some impending disaster, yes. Thank you. And to give you, an, to give you an idea of the variety of things that the Chinese did with jade, I'm going to pass around to you an image of one of the most spectacular things they ever created out of jade, and that was in complete burial suit about 2,000 years ago, made out of small squares of jade that were wired together through little holes that had wires connecting them at the corners in which there would be a face covering and a, a, a full body covering and gloves and, and shoes and everything made out of jade to encase the entire body. Um, in addition to that, there were jade body orifice plugs to keep the life essence in the body from escaping. Uh, that would be um, eight for men and nine for women. So I'll pass that around. Now, why did the Chinese get so excited about jade instead of, say, gold or diamonds, for example? Well, jade was extracted from areas of high mountains and nearby riverbeds. And because mountains in China were long associated or symbolized a way to ascend heaven, the mountains sort of reached up into the clouds or the heavenly realms, 
Jade held a very mystic power. It was believed to have very protective qualities associated with both the soul and the immortality, since, uh, hence the um, jade suit that you see. It has always had a very deep significance in Chinese culture. In the fifth century BC, Confucius, who wrote about a lot of things, um, wrote the quote that is actually on the back wall here in this exhibition about jade as representative of qualities of personal character. Confucius said, anciently superior men, sorry, he was patriarchal, anciently superior men found the likeness of all excellent qualities in jade. Soft, smooth, glossy, it appeared to them like benevolence. Fine, compact, and strong, like intelligence. Angular, but not sharp and cutting, like righteousness, its flaws not concealing its beauty, nor its beauty concealing its flaws, like loyalty. In these words, I think Confucius really captured how the Chinese have felt about jade for thousands of years. For show and tell, I brought a piece of nephrite jade. As I pass it around, please take note of a couple of things. I bought this particular piece in Turfan in Xinjiang province, far northwest China, for a specific reason. Um, it has a little bit of what we call the skin of the jade on one side. The outside of the jade boulder is actually kind of, you know, a dull brownish color. It's only when the boulder is opened that you see the beautiful uh, color of the jade stone inside. You will also see near the piece of where there's the skin of the jade, a flaw in the jade, a crack, which of course, uh, those who did jade carving had to be very aware and sometimes worked with the natural flaws in the jade stone to determine what they might use it for. So, Now, we have two objects from Neolithic China, which are now in our collection. When, when do they date from? Oh, roughly about 3000 to 2000 BC. So these are objects that are four to 5,000 years old. They're over in the case right over there, next to Amy Clegg and Claudia Brown. What do we mean when we speak of the Neolithic period? It's actually a phenomenon that happened all around the world, not just in China, but it is a cultural phenomenon that existed in other civilizations. In this fine book, which I enjoyed reading, Brian Hayden, in Archaeology, the Science of Once and Future Things, had this to say about the Neolithic period. Food producing communities, that is, Neolithic societies, first appeared about 10,000 years ago, not too long ago, when people actually started producing their own food, rather than simply hunting and gathering and using what nature provided. They thus set in motion a chain of events that has transformed the planet ever since. Food production permitted people to raise more children, increase the size of their communities, until eventually some communities evolved to become cities. It made possible increasingly complex societies with larger classes of specialists, people who did one thing instead of everybody fending for themselves. And that made possible the further rapid development in technology and all the arts of civilization. Large urban communities waged war in which the sheer size of an army might determine your success in battle. The ability to win battles then in turn determined the size of political units, the degree of complexity of society, and advances in the civilized arts. Thus, the production of food engendered the entire array of changes in society as we know it today. Now, there are three markers in this book of places that I've highlighted with yellow um, that you might glance at since um, Brian has quite a lot to say about the Neolithic world uh, and archaeology. Archaeology intrigues me because it's kind of where science and art merge together. In the same book, and I'm going to pass this around so you can take a great look at it. Notice that you buy it on print books, so not very much. <laughs> Further, Brian Hayden elaborates on this concept of what he calls big men. That is the idea that ambitious men could increase their social and economic status by organizing community feasts. Again, this happened in multiple 
civilizations. As big men sought to outdo all others through these gatherings, they then gained control of food production and resources. This is the beginning of classes in society, business, resources, and I can do something better than you kind of way of thinking. So in the spirit of competition, each feast would be more lavish than the last one. This model is supported by the concept of burying prestige objects with a few male adults in Neolithic communities and by the archeological discovery of such specialized feasting and ritual implements. Nowhere has this been more true than in China. In China, Neolithic tombs, a small number of elite males were accompanied by a set of ritual jade objects with symbolic significance to send them into the next life in the same status that they enjoyed in this life. This reinforces also the very deeply patriarchal and hierarchical aspects of Chinese society for at least the last 4,000 years. So, patriarchy and hierarchy were established in the Neolithic times and have remained true very much up until the beginning of the 20th century in China. According to some texts that were written, well, later than the Neolithic period, there were six ritual jade objects that existed. Now, of course, this has varied over time, but they were the Bi, the Cong, the Huang, the Hu, the Gui, and the Zhang. And the texts compiled around 1000 BCE indicate that at the time, it seems they were believed to represent the earth, the sky or the heavens, and the four cardinal directions. There's a lot of speculation about their use and function. The earlier you go in human society, it seems the more research there still needs to be done on exactly what the things we find through archeology span were meant to do or how they were meant to function. So I'm going to introduce to you a newly acquired object this year, which the museum obtained through the generosity of funds designated for acquisition of Asian art objects by the former Asian Arts Council. Thank you, members of the Asian Arts Council, for your generosity. I'm going to pass around also a book um, by a wonderful colleague, Jessica Ross, and I had the pleasure to meet her and spend time with her in China. Um, she is Dame Jessica Rawson, knighted by Queen Elizabeth II in England. Uh, and you will see some sticky notes, again, which you may want to browse, that will show you those six ritual kinds of objects. So the object that we have just obtained is the one that you see on the left side of this case. That is a gui or tablet. Now it might look very simple to you, but keep in mind that in the Neolithic era, era we are dealing with very simple technology. Jade is a very hard stone, so cutting jade was a very labor-intensive endeavor. It is a six on the hardness scale in gemology, if you have any point of reference for that. Um, if you look at the very top of it, you will see that it's kind of a rough edge there. Possibly that is where it was cut from a larger boulder or stone of jade. If you look at this gui tablet from the side, you will see that from the top to the bottom, it tapers down to a kind of point at the bottom end. In addition, you'll notice at the top, there is a hole there. If you look very carefully at the hole, you can see that it was drilled from both sides until it met in the middle of the stone. There are marks all over the jade that indicate this was done by a slow-moving rotary kind of drill, possibly made out of bamboo. We're not thinking here, don't think about you know, an electric drill's kind of speed, but something much, much slower. Uh, and combined, combining that with some kind of abrasive material, possibly sand or other material that was mixed with water, 
for the drilling process. And then the overall object was polished. Now you can see the original color of it here. It's a deep green, often in the, in the field uh, of Asian art that's called a spinach green. Um, lighter colors of jade sometimes are described as celadon green. There are wonderful adjectives dreamed up for the different shades of jade. You will notice there is also a kind of off-white ivory color residue on part of the Gui tablet, um, which might come from minerals or other substances over the very long time that it was buried. Now, in this instance, we don't know exactly where in China this originally came from. Its provenance only goes back as far as having been in an American collection for a very long time. It would be very interesting to be able to look into, through scientific uh, testing probably, to find out more about the um, substance on the surface of it. Now, related to it, next to it, you see a necklace that is on a um, black form there. That is our other Neolithic object in the collection, uh, which is made out of, as you can see, separate beads that were strung together, which we can presume was possibly worn or placed around the neck of the deceased in the tomb. Uh, men, of course, in most cultures wore all kinds of jewelry, so um, this again would have been probably an elite male tomb. If you get in just the right light over here and look very carefully, you will be able to see that some of the oblong beads have very, very fine patterns etched into them. Now, if you look at that one, you will see that, well, it doesn't look like a shiny jade stone at all. It looks kind of dull and beige. As a matter of fact, uh, someone who's here today commented to me, it's sort of, it looks more like wood than jade. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it does. But I can tell you, having handled the necklace, it's heavy. It's stone. So one of the questions in my mind has always been, why is this one so completely covered by this um, sort of uh, beige uh, residue on it, similar to what we see partially obscuring the uh, beautiful stone on the jade tablet? Well, sometimes, you know, you keep things in the back of your mind, and then you go on to think about other things, and then you connect two things. And in this case, that happened to me this past year. I don't know if how many of you might have seen it, but there's quite an extraordinary exhibit uh, here in Phoenix at the Arizona Science Center this year called Mummies. Did anybody catch it? Yes. And that, of course, brings up the whole subject of what different civilizations do with the corpse of the deceased uh, at the time of burial. In the mummies exhibit at the Arizona Science Center, uh, there were two types of mummies, what we might call um, deliberate and accidental. And you could see both examples in that exhibition, although the exhibition at the Arizona Science Center did not include any mummies from China. Oh, well. Uh, accidental means that these were bodies that were buried in a natural environment that somehow preserved them. In, in this case, it was either places that were very, very cold, so they literally froze, or very, very hot and dry, in which case they sort of dried out. And then there is deliberate mummification, which is, of course, epitomized by the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians figured out long ago and had an elaborate process for preserving the body. And they did that by doing two things. One was to remove the internal organs of the body and place them in jars to be interred with the body. And the other thing is to then treat the body with various kinds of unguents and materials that would help preserve it before they wrapped it in many layers of cloth. In the part of the exhibit in which they had the Egyptian mummies, which were deliberately preserved for posterity, I learned something that I had not known before. And that is that the human brain liquefies when it decomposes. I leave you to put two and two together about the necklace and that fact. Now, you will also notice in the book that's being passed around, the one by Jessica Rawson, that many burials were covered with scores of objects of different uh, shapes and forms of jade. 
I wish that we had all of the six different types from the Neolithic period, but I'm delighted that we have the new edition of one of the six types, the Jade Gui Tablet. Now the next thing I'd like to do is take a giant leap, as it were, through time, and talk about some of the other jade objects that we have on view here. Uh, jade was used consistently throughout Chinese history, from Neolithic times up to the present time. And as a matter of fact, I will pass around a book that uh, normally is on view here in the Asian gallery in the uh, somewhat uncomfortable bench that's been moved out for this talk. So you can look at it as you wish. This is a book that focuses entirely on Qing Dynasty jade. So that would span 1644 to 1911. This was a book that was put together for an exhibition that I was involved with before I came to Phoenix Art Museum. And all of these were on loan from collections in Taiwan. It has wonderful pictures, and it's bilingual. And if you look at the picture on the cover, this will give you an idea of what jadeite looks like. Jadeite, in general, tends to be more translucent, even glossier than nephrite, and has more extreme variations of color in it. Here you see white and a kind of bright green, often called apple green. And in some of the inside photos, you will see touches of lavender. If by any chance you are jade shopping in Asia somewhere, be aware that sometimes these bright green and lavender colors in the jade have been, shall we say, enhanced from their natural state. So somewhere around the 9th or 10th century, it appears that beliefs about burial uh, in China changed. And we, after about the end of the Tang Dynasty, we have far fewer tombs that are full of, well, lots of objects and elaborate uh, construction. Uh, we don't know exactly why that changed or exactly when it changed, but the other jades that we have on view here are objects that were never buried in the ground, so they haven't been transformed by any underground long-term process. We can see the jade stone more in the state than which it was when it was first carved. We can see a variety of things that are both ut utilitarian and completely decorative. To give you an idea of how carried away some people could get with jade, you will see that we have some uh, small plaques or uh, rectangular pieces that are elaborately carved. Um, they might have served as belt buckles or belt hooks. We have a group of those over here. But then again, if you were really a big man and somebody important in society, you might have an entire belt made out of these wonderful plaques. So if you take a look at some of these, you can see the wonderful color variations. This one's quite yellow. This one's almost pure white, for example. You can see that obviously the technology for working jade has probably changed over the millennium. Uh, you can see that open work designs were very favorable because think of it for a moment. If you had a very solid piece of jade and you were using it as a belt buckle, it might be a little bit heavy. So open work patterns made a lot of sense. Um, we assume that most of the belts that these would have been used on were made out of materials that are long gone, but the jade has survived beautifully. And if you come around to the opposite side after the talk, you will see some jades that are beautifully reticulated. That means completely carved through with beautiful patterns of floral designs, uh, some in the shape of butterflies, things like that, uh, which would have been very prestigious to wear. So in this case, they served to demonstrate the status and wealth of the wearer in this life. One of our other prized pieces, um, this is a Celadon, Celadon Jade Magnolia Vase, and it was a museum purchase with funds provided by, once again, the Asian Arts Council in honor of the museum's 50th anniversary 10 years ago. We were thrilled to acquire this piece, which as you see shows two jade, I'm sorry, jade magnolia blooms. If you look carefully, you will see, of course, that one is larger than the other, and also that they seem to be leaning towards each other. 
the assumption uh, with the scholar who researched and published this is that this is symbolic of marital happiness, representing a man and a woman of a married couple. The larger one being the male, the smaller being the female, and that they're leaning towards each other in happiness and uh, compatibility. Now, moving to the case towards the back, I'm not going to move all the way back there, you will see that we have three wonderful jades on view with gorgeous variations in jade color. The one that is placed highest up is a jade stone that is carved in the form of a mountain. So a wonderful correlation there, since jade was associated with mountains and with the heavenly realm. Here the jade stone has actually been carved in the form of a mountain. And if you look at it very closely, you will see that there are a couple of figures in little mountain caves or grottos. Um, the assumption is that those are probably Buddhist uh, monks, perhaps, who are meditating in caves in the mountains. In my own area of research, I can tell you that there are a lot of mountain caves in China, and many of them are indeed Buddhist. So that's a pretty solid conclusion. You'll also see wonderful variations in the stone. And to some degree, I think with that piece, we can say that the artist looked at the natural markings and colorations in the stone and decided what to carve and how to carve it so that different areas would be enhanced by the different colorations in the stone. To contrast that, the one next to it is much more unified in color, a kind of dense um, ivory or whitish color of jade, quite unusual, and very solid and heavy. And it is carved in the shape of a citron type of fruit, which um, I can't really think of what the name of it is in English, but it's usually referred to uh, in Chinese uh, as the Buddha's hand or the hand of Buddha's because, Buddha because it is a fruit that has um, sort of long extensions that look like fingers on a hand. So here that Buddha's fruit might also be a re reference to um, some symbolism in Buddhism. Uh, these were generously given to the museum um, by um, the Stack family. Um, Mr. Stack and his family uh, collected, oh, hundreds of pieces of jade. And some years back, I'm thinking uh, probably around 2005 or six, we actually had an exhibition in the gallery here of selections from the Stack collection of Chinese jade, which ranged from the Neolithic to the Qing dynasty. Those two pieces and the necklace over there uh, were gifts from the Stack family estate and made a wonderful contribution to our collection in that respect. Then finally, the last piece that I'll draw your attention to over there is the beautifully um, thinly, thinly carved piece of jade um, in the shape of a small bowl, uh, which is uh, segmented to resemble a chrysanthemum bloom. This is a style of jade carving, very precise, very thin, very delicate, uh, very refined, which is often referred to as Mughal jade because it was done at the time that the Mughal rulers lived in India. Uh, and the styles seem to have moved back and forth between India and China. Often the Mughal carved jades were then enhanced by semi-precious stones as well. If you Google that, you will find some dazzling examples online. This one has, though, something that makes it very distinctly Chinese, that would, you would not mistake it or confuse it for possibly being from India, and that is that the handles there, you see that there are rings hanging from handles, and the handles are carved in the shape of bats. Bats are a very auspicious image in Chinese art because the word for bat, fu, in Chinese, is a homonym, or sounds like, uh, the word for wealth and happiness. So it is a play on words. And that one was also acquired for a very auspicious reason. It was acquired by the museum, again from the Asian Arts Council's generosity, in honor of Marilyn and Roy Papp and their generosity to the museum. So there is a wonderful connection there between one group recognizing the generosity of a, a couple 
for what they've done for the museum and then using their own funds and generosity to recognize that by acquiring this object in their honor. So we are thrilled to have such a great variety of pieces from several different donors and supporters of the museum that have given us a range of views of types of jade, colors, variations, functions, and a long time of representation across Chinese history from the Neolithic to the 18th and 19th century. I'd be happy to answer any questions or discussion. Yes. Most kinds of imitate jade are simple as being green. What yes. percentage of jade is actually that green? I don't know that I can give you a definite number. Um, all I can say is that uh, green seems to be the most dominant color, variations and shades of green. One thing to be aware of is that uh, jade is a term that in a scientific uh, terminology refers to the two types that I talked about at, at the beginning, nephrite and jadeite. However, um, if you go jade shopping in China, you, it's good to be aware that jade becomes much more of an umbrella term in China. And it will include stones such as, um, oh, I don't know, uh, serpentine, uh, a variety of stones that in Chinese terminology look a lot like jade, so they'll be called jade, but technically they are not jade. That's as much as I can really tell you about it. But in terms of exact percentages, I don't have that figure, I'm sorry to say. By the way, um, if you Google Chinese jade, Wikipedia has an amazingly long and detailed uh, essay on the whole history of Chinese jade. I was quite impressed with it. It's heavily footnoted and drawn from very reliable sources. So um, if you want to read more about jade, I would highly recommend, in this case, uh, Wikipedia being quite good. It even quotes from Jessica Rawson, whose book is uh, traveling around the room here somewhere. Other questions or thoughts? Yes. Yes. Uh, in San Francisco. Oh, yes. The body suit? Body. Yes. Yes. That was quite extraordinary. Yes, if you had an opportunity to see that, that was amazing. Several years ago, I happened to be in New York at a time when there were two jade burial suits on loan from China at two different places uptown at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and downtown at China Institute. And I made it a point to go see both of them. Yeah, various kinds of metal, uh, very fine wires, yeah, would be placed through holes at the four corners and then connected together, all those little pieces. Mind boggling. Other thoughts or questions? Yes, Linda. Ah, yes. Is that similar in, China? Uh, in terms of its chemical makeup, I don't have um, that precise answer at the tip of my tongue. But I do know that there are resources of jade in Mexico. So um, depending on the piece, it may or may not be jadeite or nephrite. I believe what one finds in, in Mexico would be more nephrite jade rather than uh, jadeite jade. Jadeite seems to be. Um, mostly sourced out of what is today Burma, as far as I'm aware, yes. Uh, in the back, in the dark purple shirt. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, it's an object that... Oh, oh, I have a good story to tell you on that one. Yes. So, um, so I'm in, in Turfan, which is an amazing place on the, in the Chinese Silk Road. Um, let's say the environment in Turfan is a lot like Arizona, hot and dry. It's a desert climate. And uh, I'm giving a paper at the um, conference of Tulufan Shui, um, which means uh, turfanological studies. That's how the Chinese decided to translate um, the study of anything having to do with turfan. It's interdisciplinary. Uh, it's a field of studies based on a place uh, which has rich archaeological resources and people in all different kinds of disciplines, language, religion, economics, um, and such, uh, all give papers at this conference in China. 
So we made a few excursions as part of the conference, and we were at um, uh, an archaeological site. And of course, there are vendors who set up tables to sell things to tourists. So when I saw these pieces of jade on some guy's folding table, I picked that one up because I noticed that it had the, the little bit of the skin and the flaw in it there, and I was handling it. So I said to the guy behind the table, I said, so how much do you want for this and what is it used for? And so he came up to me and he took it in his hand and he ran it up and down my back like this and said, And I said, He said, you can give your old man a massage with it. And I said, okay, or my old man can give me a massage with it. <laughs> And I bought it, and then I had a rock in my suitcase for the rest of the trip. <laughs> so feel free to try it on somebody next to you. Have fun there in the back row, yes. A um, couple of rows up in the purple shirt, yes. There certainly have been vogues over time for different kinds of jade. For example, I know in the 20th century, jadeite uh, has, has drawn astronomical prices, um, and jadeite jewelry is highly coveted uh, because of its very bright colors, the lavender and the green, and its shininess. Uh, certainly at other times, nephrite has been highly prized for other reasons. Um, the spinach green is appreciated because of its deep, dark green color. But the Chinese also uh, had an affinity for a very pure white jade. So I think we can say that it's a matter of taste and it's also a matter of changing um, trends in, in fashion and preference over time. Not true sure that we can say that there's a definitely a certain hierarchy um, that's absolute in terms of color. In that way, I would say it's perhaps a little uh, different from the way we categorize diamonds or gold um, in, in Western cultures. Yes? Any reference to the Pharaoh Jade? Yes. Uh, uh, that's a vague term I'm not sure I know anything more about. We have somebody else here who's an expert that might uh, have a commentary on that, uh, Imperial Jade. Imperial jade was probably always important, but in the Qianlong period, uh, in the you know middle of the 1700s, uh, there were there was a close relationship with Burma, and so some large boulders of jade were brought, and also from Central Asia. So th it was partly a matter of sources. So Qianlong had this huge empire and tributary relations with Southeast Asia. So. P big boulders and b large amounts of jade were brought to the court. So I think that's probably why the Qianlong period jades are uh, especially famous. Yes. <laughs> and of course, if you visit the, the palace, the Forbidden City in Beijing, you will be amazed to see a huge boulder that was brought by one of these, as one of these uh, gifts, and then carved by craftsmen at the court into a mountain scene like this, only very, very tall, with scenes of uh, the mythical emperor Yu and controlling the waters, so sort of inventing irrigation, controlling the rivers and, and dams, and creating agriculture for China. So, it, yeah, so imperial jade could have. Uh, pretty big role if the materials were available, I think. Thank you, Dr. Claudia Brown. Yes. And um, in addition to Burma, the, the Chenlong Empire uh, expanded into northwest China and uh, covered some of the areas like Turfan and other areas in Xinjiang province in northwest, what is today northwest China. Um, so they had that source of nephrite as well. And that gets into a part of Asia that uh, northern India also would be close to. So you can see that the Mughal Empire and the, and the Qing Empire, roughly at, at uh, similar time periods, they were both going for some of the, the finest jade to be had in their imperial courts. Yes? Oh, yes. That is a custom made base, yes, and it came with the piece. Mm -hmm. 
No telling. Likely later. Uh, that's a custom wood base. Um, so when it was made is a little hard to say. A little bit like picture frames on pictures or oil paintings, for example. We don't always know that the frame would have been original. But whenever that was carved, it was carved exactly to fit that. Yes, you have to set it in just right, and then it works. Uh, that's the case with both of those two pieces there that have custom fitted piece, uh, bases for them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I encourage you to take a close-up look at all of these pieces because really the beauty is in the details and appreciating the, the, both the workmanship and the stone of the jade. And I thank all of you for coming and joining us today. And again, for the generosity of our donors, especially the Asian Arts Council. <laughs>
uh, the government bureaucracy. Although one, seem, one young boy over here seems to have a mind of his own. He has taken off his clothes and is going into the lotus pond. <laughs> Don't know what became of him, but I, I, I'm partial to him in particular. But it reinforces that again uh, in, let's see, we are put it, dating this to 17th, 18th century, so that's in the Qing Dynasty. Uh, patriarchy and hierarchy was alive and well, very much. Um, with the 100 boys here. So um, feel free to take a look today and also come back after the middle of um, Thanksgiving, uh, right before Thanksgiving, we'll be changing it here. So uh, during the holiday season, so you can meet the rest of the boys. And yes. Oh, very good point. Thank you, Julia. Right now we have on view an exhibition called um, Phoenix Art, uh, the past decade, which highlights uh, gifts that have been given in the last 10 years, since the 50th anniversary, since this year, as a matter of fact, I believe it is this month, we are celebrating the museum's 60th anniversary. And so there are some lovely gifts from generous donors to the Asian collection, as well as all the other areas of the museum's collection on view in the cat's wing lower level. Feel free to go over and enjoy those as well. Thank you so much for joining us today.